three, two, one, ignition. I want us as a species to go to Mars. And I thought to myself, well, that is a place. It's not just an idea, but it's a place plus ideas. There might be life there. We might learn something. There are new discoveries in the new places. So I said, all right, how, what did people do in the past to engage in expensive projects? Because if we go to Mars, that's going to be expensive. And somebody's going to have to write the check if we did such a thing. Is that even justifiable to do this? I'm going to look at all the things humans have done throughout time. Find out what it cost as a fraction of the GDP of the day. And then ask how much does it cost to go to Mars today? And then line that up in the chart and find out what motivated them to do whatever was this other activity. And maybe we can duplicate that in modern times. That's how we would then engage in major funded projects, I thought to myself. And here's what I found. There were only three motivators in the history of human culture that drove nations and states to do great things. Great as in large, unforgettably magnificent. An investment of human and financial capital. We can make a list of what would be there. So the pyramids, that's big and expensive, and they're still around. The pyramids, Great Wall of China, the Manhattan Project, the Apollo Project, the Columbus Voyages. We'd all agree, these are expensive things undertaken by nations. What did they have in common? Only one of three things. The greatest driver of them all is obvious. It's the I don't want to die driver, all right? The war driver. That's where you get the Great Wall of China. That's where you get the Manhattan Project. Time and time and again, the conduct of our species has demonstrated that if you feel threatened, money flows like rivers to minimize that threat. There's another driver, the promise of economic return. That's how you get the Columbus voyages and Magellan voyages, uh, Lewis and Clark. You get investments where people say, I don't want to die poor. There's a third driver that's less of today, common centuries ago, and that's the praise of royalty or deity. That got you the cathedral building in Europe. The pyramids, that's praise of royalty. There's less of that today, hardly any of that today. You don't see whole nations investing huge amount of money in the service of God or their king. It just doesn't happen much anymore. So there are two drivers. If you want to do something expensive and it does not fulfill one of those two drivers, it's not going to happen, period. Unless you're going to claim that you live in a very special community that differs in its outlook on the causes and effects of investment and human dreams. If you have to say that you are different from every civilization that has come before you. I don't see evidence of that. Physicists are experts in matter, motion, and energy. And war is about putting energy that is here, there. That's all it is. If there's a target, you don't want that target to exist anymore. You take the energy that you created here and you put it at the target. That destroys the target. That is war reduced to its most fundamental laws of physics. All right. Well, I understand that. You can build centers because you feel threatened. It was a cold war. Sure. I understand that. 1989, peace broke out in Europe. We almost had the largest accelerator in the world, superconducting super collider. Started construction on it in Texas in the 1980s. It was the next frontier in physics. If you go in a place in energy that no one has been before, you're gonna discover something. It's that simple. Because you're stepping where no one has stepped before. That is exploration in the laboratory. So here we are riding a century of American leadership in particle physics. But what I'm going to say is that when peace broke out, it became harder for people to justify, particularly those writing the checks, why you'd be spending this much money on physics anymore. The Soviet Union was gone. 
budget got cut to zero, and that knocked out the frontier of particle physics in America. Well, interesting thing about science is that it continues anywhere else in the world. You don't have a monopoly on it. So CERN, the European Center for Nuclear Research, they built the Large Hadron Collider, the most powerful particle accelerator in the world, and they discovered the Higgs boson. It's a particle whose field grants mass to other particles. We would have discovered that particle 20 years ago. Our accelerator was three times the power of that one. Now, why do I mention this? Well, war isn't the only driver. Economics is too. It's a huge driver. It's not immediately lucrative to do it. So corporations, their R&D can't justify it. There's this zone that can only be touched by the government dollar if the government cares about its future. So you have the engineers working on the new physics, the new sciences, but you need the science as well. What are some examples of this? In the 1700s, we started to study the concept of heat, energy. In the days of Isaac Newton, the concept of energy was not formulated scientifically. It was not well understood. It would take another century then you get like a steam engine and you start figuring out how to convert energy from one form into another. Mechanical energy, chemical energy, energy of gravity, gravitational potential. And all these forms of energy can be converted into one another with the right machine. Thus was born the Industrial Revolution. And the nations that embraced the Industrial Revolution led the world in every metric that mattered in civilization. So. What would next happen? Middle 1800s, Michael Faraday playing with electricity on a tabletop. He takes a wire and moves it through a magnetic field and a dial jumps that the wire is connected to. Well, if you do this over here and something else happens over here, that's really intriguing to a physicist. Michael, what are you doing? Because I think it was a member of parliament who came and asked, what are you wasting government money for? He has a famous reply to that. Is this what we're paying you to do, to make these tabletop toys? He says, I don't know of what use this will one day be, but I guarantee you, sir, one day you will tax it. Passing the wire through a magnetic field is how we generate electricity today. It is the foundation of all generators, turbines. Anything that turns creates electricity and something else makes it turn. You're moving wires through magnetic fields. That was in the mid 1800s. We didn't electrify cities until turn of the century, the early 1900s. It took 50 years for his tabletop experiments in the hands of clever engineers and technologists to transform the world and how we lived. Now you just flick a switch on the wall, all the lights turn on. We've known since the Industrial Revolution and earlier that innovation in science and technology, yes, it'll help defend the nation. But when you're not at war, you know what else innovation in science and technology does? It is the engine of tomorrow's economy. The engine. When Einstein wrote down his equation for the stimulated emission of radiation, which is the foundation of the laser, was he thinking to himself, barcodes. This is innovation in science, the applications of his ideas into machines, requires the clever engineer, creative investors and dynamic CEOs turn it into product. Don't ever tell me why are you studying this? How is it helping me? You know, I don't know how it's gonna help you. I have no idea. Neither did Faraday, he just knew you would tax it. Neither did Einstein, neither did anybody who made great discoveries about our understanding and our relationship to nature.